All right, welcome everybody uh, to another Staff B call uh, where we're going to be focusing again on bioinformatics analysis. Uh, today we are welcoming Patrick Chain back to the Staff B call. Uh, Patrick Chain, for those of you who don't know, is a bioinformatics scientist at Los Alamos National Labs. Um, and today we're going to be talking about their bioinformatics solution built into the Edge platform, a really nice, clean user interface uh, that gives users access to a lot of sophisticated bioinformatics analysis tools. And their most recent um, iteration of Edge includes COVID-19 uh, genome assembly and variant calling. Um, so with that, Patrick, I'm going to go ahead and mute myself. And if you want to take it away, go ahead. Okay, thanks. Thanks a lot, Kevin. Uh, just to show you how much, uh, how little sleep I think I've been getting, I don't even remember uh, that I was, that I had presented um, prior to this on Staff B. Um, I have tried to make a couple of your more recent sessions, but I was unable to really uh, participate in any uh, way since I've been on multiple calls. But um, I also wouldn't present this as a solution, uh, but I would like to present it as a potential for collaboration. Um, uh, I, I'm going to frame this in how we see the world or how our group uh, has approached this and uh, maybe some of the background information as to what motivated us to, uh, to, to start uh, in this direction. Um, so we have a, a main website. It's um, the, the URL is in the middle. Um, our group uh, overall uh, has paid a lot of attention to quality and standards and genomics uh, in the past. Um, uh, I, I could cite that LANL was the birthplace of, uh, of the NCBI or GenBank uh, and the Human Genome Project, but that really predated me, so I have nothing to do, to do with that. Uh, but we have participated in uh, the Genomic Standards Consortium, which was a big uh, influence in the earlier days of genomics to try and set some standards. Um, uh, I'm involved in a newer effort from DOE, this National Microbiome Data Collaborative, uh, and I'd be very interested to have some of you on board uh, for this. That focuses primarily on um, fair, uh, on, on being able to find uh, data sets of interest, uh, which, you know, if you've tried searching SRA lately, uh, it's sometimes quite difficult. Uh, and again, more recently, we've joined this coronavirus standards working group. Their focus is primarily on reagents and uh, our efforts on this uh, in this middle tab or this middle card on assay validation or evaluation is what kind of set us in that in that direction. So, um, uh, as I'm sure this group is very well aware, this continued increase in use of genomics is very useful for uh, epidemiology, and uh, we've approached it. Uh, first, from the biosurveillance standpoint, looking for detecting where pathogens might be, um, but obviously uh, this information lends itself very well to being able to uh, ascertain whether or not um, genomes are evolving in a certain way. Um, uh, that might prohibit um, diagnostic uh, um, uh, positives or, or maybe giving false negatives and also for therapeutics. Um, so we, we really strongly advocate for high quality genomics and standardized processes to inform us of the presence and diversity evolution. And that, uh, and our first foray into, into this, outside of on the security angle, just trying to determine where uh, the origin of this thing in early January, we started playing a lot more on the diagnostic angle and looking at uh, available assays given uh, some of the issues with uh, uh, assays early on. Uh, and we have not implemented uh, for public use yet, but we've talked to a few groups for automated redesign of any assay that appears to, um, uh, to fail or to at least uh, become less sensitive. Uh, we have a great group of uh, individuals working on this, and this is the team. Uh, we should give a big shout out, particularly for the focus of this talk, which is on the, the left card on this slide, our edge bioinformatics piece. Um, to Mike Wiley and Jason Ladner, we had grabbed or worked with them on establishing a higher, pro, a higher throughput or a, a automated um, uh, 
consensus genome calling for some of their early Ebola efforts uh, a few years ago. Uh, and Daryl Doman and Daryl Dinwiddie at UNM have, uh, have uh, provided good feedback on some of our initial versions. And same with Daesung Lee in Korea and a number of others that have been uh, helping us uh, improve our, our current workflow. Um, I, I'm going to be skipping around and dancing a little bit because I understand that uh, if you're interested in genomics, you probably care about all aspects of, of this. This is kind of the increase in, um, in genomes over time deposited into both GISAID and GenBank. Um, we're, we present this on our website as well, um, uh, and we keep it fairly up to date. Uh, it's not daily yet, but it, uh, it will be very shortly. Um, uh, in comparison, Ebola only has 2,000 genomes uh, during the 2014 to 2013 to 2016 uh, epidemic um, or outbreak, and uh, that, that's a typo that's, uh, which I can fix live because, because I'm not in presentation mode. Uh, and almost the same number of SRAs. This is not true for, um, uh, for SARS-CoV-2, and uh, I'll, I'll show you a slide on SRA uh, a little bit later. Uh, so uh, this was a, a real as of May 3rd. I believe now we're above 20,000 uh, genomes. So uh, there, there's um, uh, a continuous increase in the uh, data dumps uh, into a variety, into both GISAID and GenBank. So uh, one of the issues is that they're not completely overlapping. Uh, so you'd have to find the redundancies between them if you want to use or get access to all of them. Uh, we cared about getting high quality phylogenetic uh, use out of these data. And so we filtered out uh, non-complete genomes. So genomes are deposits that were under 29 KB. Uh, this only filtered out a few, a handful of these sequences. Um, and uh, we removed duplicates. And the majority of the ones that were in GenBank, at least at this stage, were duplicates. Uh, again, this was only as of May 4th, and there's been an increase since then. Um, this workflow presented here is primarily just for our own interest in obtaining genomes. Uh, and this is for our assay screening, which is not really the main topic here, but since we put a lot of effort in it, I thought I'd take advantage of this stage to, to present it. Um, uh, we have an, adilter, an additional filtering step, uh, which is, uh, you know, to only keep high quality genomes. Uh, and that's mostly based on the GISAID uh, standard. If any of you have really tried to uh, automate uh, the process of obtaining genomes from GISAID, you uh, can understand some of the issues that uh, Paul has uh, had to face. Um, uh, this shows uh, his uh, GitHub uh, fixes over time. Uh, it used to be just a weekly uh, fix to, uh, to adopt uh, or uh, circumvent any changes that were made to the website. Uh, more recently, there have been frequent changes even per day uh, that we've had to deal with to be able to, uh, to try and accommodate automated scraping. Um, this tool is available uh, and you can use it, but it gets outdated really fast. Uh, we keep an eye on this and we push as frequently as possible um, so that we can also make use of this. And if you're interested in any of these uh, information, uh, you can email anyone in our group. Um, uh, on our website, there's a link for an email. Um, I'm sure Kevin can distribute uh, my email as well and I can route you to the, to the, to the real experts. I'm, I'm really just a figurehead here at this stage. So um, the, our heat map, uh, sorry, our, um, uh, our assay evaluation page, we present kind of a total recall uh, rates on, uh, for the different diagnostics. And I want to use this uh, zoom in view just to highlight a few things. We present this as a phylogeny paired with a heat map, just showing you where there are mismatches in um, in some of the primers or in the entire assay. Uh, the original Charité assays, um, if any of you are familiar, they were originally designed for SARS or SARS-like bat coronaviruses. Um, uh, and so there are known mismatches, if that's not a big deal. Um, the NIID is a Japanese institute. Their assay originally designed has been modified since and does work, but uh, just to highlight issues with genomics, 
Um, they designed their assay uh, when the genome was first released and it was modified twice. And the second time it was modified, which was 12 days after their initial release, uh, they, a single nucleotide change. And uh, that, that means that uh, their assay is essentially, uh, does not match any genome 100%. Um, and so I, uh, we feel strongly for high quality genomes being input right away uh, and for these checks to go on before submission. Um, we do see signs of uh, mismatches now. If I have enough time, I can run you through our assay page. Um, I have it up. It takes a few seconds to load, unless you're on Firefox, it might take a bit longer, but um, uh, embedded in the heat map and on the leaves of the tree are uh, the metadata associated with the genomes, as well as uh, all the data associated with the assay, where the mismatches are, what the primers are, et cetera. Um, so, uh, in part, this, is, this was one of the motivations to try and uh, uh, think more about uh, automated uh, high-quality genome from raw data. Um, so one thing is uh, trying to get poor um, uh, metadata up to spec. If you've been trying to use some of the, the genomes, and even in my previous map, um, uh, there, there are some uh, labels here that essentially are unknown. So we don't have any geography that are ascribed to them, so they can't be used in, um, you know, in, in some of the higher uh, end analyses, such as uh, those performed by NextStrain. It would be really nice to be able to include uh, all the genomes that we have, uh, since there are now over 20,000 of them. Uh, I think our tree is updated uh, to about 15.5 thousand uh, genomes at this stage. Uh, we do have it updated in-house. We're just waiting for a release. So, um, uh, as I mentioned, issues with genomes can mislead and uh, cause problems. Uh, uh, there are many, many different sequencing approaches out there. A lot of people are using the Arctic protocol for, um, uh, for NinION or for ONT in general. Um, uh, it's been adopted by Joel and others to, uh, to accommodate Illumina uh, sequencing. Uh, there are other Amplicon strategies. There are probe enrichment uh, strategies as well. Um, uh, every single strategy typically involves an individual lab that develops their own pipelines with their own tools, possibly uh, definitely their own parameters of cutoffs. They have different decision trees on what to do when certain things don't match their expected values. Uh, and all of this results in uh, an almost impossible interpretation of the resulting genomes. Um, uh, it's also very difficult, difficult for many labs to run their own local analyses, so they rely on, uh, you know, websites or tools, BLAST, a number of different things to, to conduct, you know, any validation piece. Um, uh, it's also very difficult, as probably most of you know, to, uh, to submit to a public repo and even the decision making on when and what to do with the genome uh, that you see in front of you. Since we all care about the quality of our products, what do we do with gaps? What do we do with low coverage areas? How do you even define what a low coverage area is? What do I do with variants, et cetera? Um, and so uh, one thing that I could, uh, uh, another motivation for us were, were labs that were already using um, some of our software. So uh, I, um, I can show you one example of what people do. Um, uh, I guess that's not right. Um, uh, with raw data uh, from uh, either locally, and this, this one's grabbed from SRA, and it's a really large data set. It even took 40 minutes just to download uh, on this occasion. That was probably through our firewall, so it might be faster view. This is only the results view of one project, this, uh, this SRR number. Um, it, it took 15 hours to run. Uh, this was using our, uh, our old, our tried and true edge bioinformatics platform. Um, uh, here you can see what was run. So it's quality control on your data, assembly and annotation. Uh, uh, a reference-based analysis was done uh, against the Wuhan uh, HE1 strain and a taxonomy classification for all data. 
this particular data set is, um, and this is all automatically downloaded. Uh, so this is um, uh, human lung uh, metagenome. Uh, also, uh, just to, uh, to show you some of the problems with metadata, um, you know, uh, the host is human for sure. The sample type, I, I don't know if the sample type is really human. Um, uh, the, the, the one who submitted it, who said submitted by uh, PDAL Conan Ren, I don't know what that is, but uh, I'm pretty sure it's not a sequencing center. Uh, uh, so there are a number of issues uh, therein. Um, Pre-processing of data, um, uh, the data looked, uh, even though the data was pre-cleaned, pre-filtered in some fashion, it looked really bad to begin with, and so we got rid of 50% of the data. Um, the assembly and annotation, I won't actually go through. Um, uh, Reference-based analysis, this was using um, the Wuhan HE1 complete genome. Um, uh, zero gaps, zero SNPs, zero indels, 100% coverage, 640-fold coverage on, on average, uh, yet it's only using 0.56 of all the data. Um, I didn't show you the full data set, but it was 56 million reads to begin with. So this was a full mini-seq run, uh, a lot of data in hand. Um, they were sequencing a metagenome, it seems. Uh, it did result in three contigs that also mapped uh, 997 percent of the genome with uh, 36 bases missing, presumably at one of the two ends, which you can look in JBrowse and, and uh, scan through the genome in that way. Um, and uh, this was in the early days of the, uh, the outbreak where uh, we had yet to include um, uh, any of the reference genomes for SARS-CoV-2 in our databases, so uh, we wanted to see what our taxonomy classification tool would do if, in case we were just doing routine biosurveillance. Uh, and you can see that, um, uh, I'll just open the heat map view, which is one of the easier ones to look at, and that just shows um, uh, some human microbiome uh, organisms like Vianella, Prevotella, um, uh, and then also this severe acute respiratory syndrome related coronavirus and further down below this bad coronavirus. And some of the tools that we use include Gotcha and Pangea, which we develop um, uh, that find um, uh, uh, this SARS related uh, coronavirus very highly. Um, it is found by a few other tools as well at a lower uh, frequency. So, um, so, so that's kind of the view from some of the labs that were doing this, and there still wasn't a good way to get your, um, we, we output a consensus reference genome, but we certainly didn't go through the rigors like we did with um, the pipeline that uh, Mike Weil and Jason Ladner had provided uh, or had, uh, that we had worked on with them. So we created this workflow. Um, I'm going to make, uh, uh, fun of my group since I have uh, two different views of the exact same workflow that to me don't look entirely the same. They're both fairly accurate though, um, but uh, one of them is more from a uh, probably human readable standpoint and the other is more from a bioinformaticist standpoint. Um, uh, since I was told by Kevin that this audience is pretty diverse, I I'm deciding to show both. Um, you guys can vote on which one uh, you prefer and then the two folks who designed it can, uh, well, one of them can buy the other a drink uh, later. Um, so we start with raw data and a reference genome. Uh, we, by default, use the Wuhan uh, HE1 reference. You can use any reference that you really want. However, anything that's in, uh, that's in our database, I forget when it was updated, but it has a lot of uh, SARS-CoV-2 databases now, or reference genomes now. Um, uh, we do have uh, data QC as an option uh, recommended. Uh, you can do primer trimming. Um, uh, one of the issues with metadata is we don't get the exact protocol, so we don't actually know what to trim if they have not done any trimming themselves. Um, you can also do host removal. Um, uh, I, I failed to mention up front, uh, but you know, since I remembered it now, um, this workflow is online, but it's available as a Docker container, so you can have it and run it locally. I understand there are issues with um, uh, human removal and uh, what uh, data is allowed to go out of any uh, particular institute, including ours. 
um, that might be uh, that might allow you to identify uh, human subjects. So, um, so if you need to do that, you can uh, you can run everything locally. Otherwise, you can pre-screen against human locally and then just dump those data um, uh, either in SRA and grab them through SRA, or there's an upload function which I can show you uh, uh, in a, in a few minutes. Um, so uh, with the reference genome, you can view the reference uh, sequence and the reference annotation. Um, uh, after read mapping, this just generates a BAM uh, uh, file, which we can convert for additional views on uh, as different tracks for the genome browser. Um, uh, if you decide to enact a uh, consensus, uh, which we believe most people want to do, uh, we use a few different tools to get a consensus. Um, uh, we do sub, uh, subsampling or downsampling down to 300 full coverage just for viewing purposes. It's not ideal. We will eventually switch tools uh, to accommodate something that uh, can do everything a little bit better and faster, but we're not there yet. Um, uh, similarly, we're converting from BCF tools to something else like Freebase uh, for variant calling and analysis that can hopefully accommodate uh, uh, Oxford Nanopore a little bit better. Um, Right now, by default, we're not uh, doing variant calling uh, with Oxford Nanopore data. By, by default, you can turn it on. It takes a while. Um, it'll skip the indels since it, uh, it's difficult for uh, BCF tools to deal with that. But uh, outside of that, I think we should be good. Uh, we generate a consensus genome. And we've even included an optional uh, uh, push button submission to GISAID as long as you have the appropriate metadata uh, included. Um, uh, as part of your uh, as part of your project, <clears throat> uh, a different view of the same workflow. It's essentially the same thing, except some of the tools are outlined. Uh, we have our own quality control tool, but it doesn't really matter. Uh, virtually all quality control tools do the same thing uh, for Illumina data. Uh, we use Porchop and then Plot for display and for doing the cleaning of uh, Oxford uh, 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 for OMT data. Um, uh, we allow you to uh, trim any of the three versions of the Arctic protocol automatically. Uh, if you have your own primer set, you can include those. We also have host removal, as I mentioned. We use different tools, obviously, for uh, Illumina or Nanopore. Um, the variant calling steps are here. If you decide to enact them, these are a number of the, uh, uh, the parameters that are used. You can have access to these slides if you want as well, if you want to recreate or try something slightly different. You can modify the parameters, uh, at least some of the parameters on our, uh, in our GUI. Uh, uh, another thing I didn't mention, and I'll probably forget later, so I'll mention it now, is you can, anything in Edge, you can just enact command line. It's not, uh, it's not you know, uh, so strung to, to the GUI. It's just uh, very convenient to, to use and to look at and to organize your, your data sets. Uh, there's a black box here for a consensus genome generation, which I'll get to later. That gives you a genome fast day, which you can submit. Um, uh, some uh, more details on consensus generation and what we've decided to do, which uh, may not be the best and is up for discussion. Um, uh, we consider GAP uh, as a, a small lowercase n's. That's what we include in our reference genome. That's when zero reads map to it. Uh, if we have lower than five fold coverage, um, or if none of the nucleotides reaches 50% uh, of the reads that, uh, that are over that nucleotide position, we consider that an ambiguous base and we, and we call it as a capital N. Um, everything else has to have a higher than five minimum coverage and has to be at least 50%. Um, we don't do anything with the variants right now. That's an option. We do have that in our in some of the output files, but we don't include that. There's no real good way to capture that yet, um, uh, unless you make an entire uh, gen bank record. Um, we've uh, gone through the steps of validate, validating our uh, our workflow against some available Illumina and ONT data sets. So we've um, uh, done our best to find uh, paired uh, SRA data with um, GISAID or GenBank genomes. Uh, this was a few weeks ago before the most recent dumps of data, uh, which some of which have a lot of paired data. Uh, I'll get to some of those issues in a minute. Um, 
Uh, we do NUCMER alignment between uh, the genome and the Wuhan reference genome, and we extract all the SNPs, indels, uh, and everything else. And we compare what we get from the reference, uh, their genome compared with our reference and uh, our automated process and what we get compared to that reference. And then we just make sure that these numbers match or we try and verify or validate what happened when they don't match. Um, uh, I'm, I'm gonna, I probably shouldn't have put this on this slide. I'm just gonna use this as a, an entry point into our, uh, into our site. So, um, Maybe I shouldn't have clicked on that. The issues with uh, doing anything live. Oh, apparently I refreshed this. So um, this window I'm just gonna kill. Uh, uh, I, I have, fortunately I have another window open, but um, I, I don't know if it'll load. Okay, this is our assay site. I'm, uh, yeah, I won't go through any of these details, but we do have a lot of data and metadata uh, associated with this. Um, so our workflow for, um, for COVID-19, uh, for our COVID-19 version of EDGE uh, is here. I'm already logged in, so that's good. Um, uh, if you want to run data, uh, well, if you want to upload your files, you can just drag and drop here. Uh, we have a lot of documentation here, and you can find um, documentation online. The Docker container is available as well from here. Same with our GitHub repo, so you can grab the source code if you prefer. Um, uh, if you want to run data, uh, I selected this uh, for a reason because I'm hoping that it goes quickly. Uh, stack retest. All right. So, uh, this is designed essentially to be uh, as easy as possible. Um, uh, there are additional uh, parameters and things that you can uh, modify if you uh, so choose. I tend to just run straight up. <coughs> uh, by default, we only have the pre-processing and the reference-based analysis turned on. You can turn on the assembly if you'd like. Um, if you didn't enter anything correctly, it'll let you know. Uh, at the bottom of this page when you submit. Um, otherwise, it should uh, all be green and uh, be ready to go. Um, if I try a second test and I, I don't know, I don't enter an SRA number, it'll just tell me that something's missing and you can click on this and it should bring you to that location. Um, so I have Staff B test running here. Uh, It'll give me an update of what happens and when it's done. It's already downloaded the metadata, and this is um, <clears throat> uh, a sample from Australia. I know it's a pretty small sample, so it should run pretty quickly and should be done by the time I'm done with, uh, with whatever talk I have. Uh, we've run and made public a few different data sets, uh, especially our validation data sets, if you want to take a look at them. <clears throat> um, and I'll let that run to completion. We'll take a look at it when it's done. So, um, so here's our validation data. We took a look at uh, these four Illumina data sets and another four ONT data sets. Um, <clears throat> and we just validated the number of SNPs found <clears throat> in the reference compared with, sorry, in their genome compared with the Wuhan reference. <clears throat> so very few SNPs are found. It's a slow evolving virus, as you know. I should have brought water. <clears throat> and, um, and out of our workflow, we have the same number of SNPs. We've gone through and validated the locations of these, so <coughs> they, uh, this, they have the exact same SNP profile. We've also looked at small indels. Uh, our workflow identified one uh, additional indel in this um, uh, HKU, this Hong Kong University uh, data set, which um, I guess I can go to right now. Uh, <coughs> So um, this uh, data set is, again, from it, part of the project titles from different patients, but this is one data set from uh, probably from one patient. Um, I don't know the protocol that was used. 
it's min-ion data and we present some of the standard graphs that you're looking um, from ONT. Uh, the, the results tab is uh, right here, the reference-based analysis. That's all that was, uh, that was called. Um, we have over 8,000 reads that map. That only represents 1% of the data. It's most of the, the genome, 150-fold coverage. We have a single SNP, a single indel. There are some ends, uh, and both ambiguous ones, and there's real gaps. Uh, again, probably at the beginning and not the end. Um, we've done a quality check that's kind of ready to submit. That's our own metrics of what, how we feel about the genome, uh, which we would uh, appreciate some feedback on. Um, you can download the consensus if you want, uh, or get to, to the consensus. Um, uh, this is actually a view of the, the genome itself in the, the JBrowse genome uh, browser that's provided. Um, uh, this is actually the location of the single uh, indel that we have called. Um, uh, it's not a complete fraction or representation of the data. Um, uh, of the cleaned data or the subsample data, about 63% uh, uh, of the data says that there's a deletion of this position. 2% um, uh, of the data says there's an insertion, and then there's a number of other metrics here that suggest uh, either different nucleotides like T or G or C, um, but the majority of the, the reads, and some reads that, uh, that agree with the reference, which is an A uh, of this position. Uh, the, if you're familiar with this type of view, the bars inside here represent the, uh, the, the, the fraction of the reads that agree, and then the, the lighter shade is <clears throat> the overall genome coverage at these positions. So um, uh, I, I'm actually not a fan of any genome browser, but this is one that's uh, readily enacted within, uh, uh, within, the, within our web framework. So that's what we've gone with. So after we move, move the, the panel. Um, and uh, we could look at a few additional um, uh, uh, things here. There's a, we provide a change log that kind of um, uh, outlines all the positions that have changed. So there's uh, the, if you uh, import this into Excel or, uh, this is just tab delimited, but you'll see that these zeros correspond to the, uh, to the depth of coverage. So there's no reads that cover the very beginning four positions of the genome. And then it starts picking up at position five, but only one, one read uh, throughout. And then essentially up until nucleotide 50, there's, uh, there's four reads or less that cover that, um, that area. And so we've just considered that entire swab um, uh, as ends uh, for our purposes. Um, there are two positions in the middle of the genome that, um, uh, sorry, um, that differ. One of them is a, a single nucleotide SNP uh, where 92% of the data suggests that it's a C versus a T call. And then um, at the one position that I just showed you, it's an A in the consensus and a deletion in, in most of the data. Um, if we look at all the data, it's about 54% of the data uh, suggests that it's a deletion. Uh, there's another fraction that suggests different uh, nucleotides. Uh, I'm, I'm actually not an ONT expert, so uh, anyone who's really used to looking at, um, at ONT data, I understand that there are biases. We know the biases for indels, but um, position-wise, there also appears to be significant bias for, um, uh, for indels. And uh, if there are better tools out there to post-process some of these data, we'd uh, welcome uh, that feedback and uh, to iterate over this. So this is the type of data that you can glean from it. Um, my test is run through, so it only took two minutes. Um, uh, this is... Uh, uh, raw sequence reads, doesn't tell me what kind. This says Illumina iSeq 100. Uh, I know that this is clean data, but you'll see this as well. So um, half a million um, data points. Uh, most of it is kept. It's all high quality data. It's pre, 
pre-trimmed uh, already, as far as we can tell. I normally tell just by, you know, if the average read length before I process anything is not an equal, you know, 151 nucleotides, then they've pre-trimmed it, and you can see this distribution of, uh, uh, of trimming. So in this particular case, um, uh, uh, we have very few uh, mapped data, uh, very little fold coverage, um, so not very good, uh, I would say not, not a very good data set. I should have asked for a different, uh, uh, a different example, not one that just uh, that looks clean or that runs fast. Uh, our site has been used by a number of different people from around the world, and uh, some of their data sets look really good. Uh, some people do invoke um, uh, uh, assembly, and then they look and compare the assembled uh, contig versus the reference and the SNPs that they call from there versus the reads. Um, I don't have any of these examples since we didn't uh, generate any data ourselves uh, yet, and I didn't run them through, but, um, but you guys are more, more than welcome to. Um, uh, this was the one example that I showed you for the extra indel. Um, uh, uh, I don't know, for, for me, it's maybe a toss up of whether or not we should call that as something to just double check in manually versus um, uh, calling it one way or another. Um, uh, other issues that we've looked at. So we've actually looked not only at SNPs and indels, but at the number of gaps that we report, the number of ends that we introduce. Uh, and I'm showing you gaps that we find in the middle of the genome. Uh, I know there are other issues with uh, other data sets that people have noticed. Um, uh, this is the uh, quasi-famous uh, genome from the, the first tiger that was uh, ill. Um, it received quite a bit of press. Uh, um, uh, looking at their data set, at their genome entry, uh, their genome looks very good. Um, when we used the raw data, we found uh, a large number of additional ends that we included. So regions that we were not very confident in or that we declared as full out gaps. So we had 174 nucleotides that looked questionable. We just didn't think that we could call it and 268 that were gaps within the genome. One of these is right in the middle of the genome, uh, position, I, I don't know, 18 KB, oh, 19 KB. Uh, I should read the slide. Obviously, this was passed to me last minute. Um, so right in the middle, there's absolutely no coverage. Uh, right in the ends, uh, these, uh, this track is depth of coverage, if you can't read that. Um, this coverage is less than five, and so we have a stretch of these ambiguous nucleotides, but then the rest we consider are gaps. There are no data that uh, go over this. Um, I know from discussions with other labs and in the prior outbreaks, um, you know, what do we do with regions of the genome that are not covered? Should we just fill them in with the reference genome, assuming that they're the same because the genomes are so similar to begin with, and that gives us anchor points and it's easier for alignment protocols and bioinformatics tools to process, or should we include uh, ends instead? And, uh, you know, how many ends and, you know, what, what about our confidence values? Uh, we advocate for ends, uh, but we're happy to have that discussion with others. Um, so we assume that uh, they didn't adhere to any uh, threshold of coverage, and so it didn't matter if there was one X coverage or zero. Uh, if there was zero, it looks like they may have defaulted to the reference, and, which is we double checked and that's entirely identical. Um, and if it's less than five, uh, they may have either used the consensus or decide to use the reference genome as consensus. Um, uh, uh, to, to try and show some of the, the issues with, um, with SRA uh, and, and finding these data sets. Uh, it, it was extremely tough. Uh, this is just a, a statistics view, uh, just showing uh, new weekly deposits into SRA. They do not even come close to matching the number of genomes that are deposited in GISAID, probably because it's just so much easier to submit there. That comes with that big caveat that the amount of metadata that's available will not really describe how well or what the protocols were to generate that genome. Um, uh, th this view is, uh, this top view on the top right um, isn't truly representative. It's log scale and it 
kind of shows this even distribution. But in reality, if you just look at this linear scale map, almost all the data for ONT has come uh, in the last week on May 2nd. <clears throat> and there were two major or three or four major data dumps for Illumina data, uh, which are much more recent than the number of genomes uh, that climbed pretty early on. Um, in terms of metadata, again, uh, uh, this is tongue in cheek. This is obviously not forecasting. Um, but these data sets, apparently the collection date was in October uh, or July, uh, which has yet to occur. So um, uh, having accurate metadata will be uh, of critical interest, especially for those really looking at the evolution uh, and epidemiology of this virus. Um, and so the last, uh, yeah, the last real slide I wanted to show um, uh, is, you know, today we've got almost 20, yeah, over 2,300 genomes just in just 8 alone. <clears throat> uh, only about 5,000 SRA experiments, the majority of which have come actually very recently. Um, uh, the more recent ones, we, they do have, uh, we can figure out a way to map those data uh, to available genomes. So that creates a rich data set that we can use to um, either learn, either deep learning or machine learning method, or just learn by looking at the data and figuring out what, um, uh, what additional protocols, threshold cutoffs, et cetera, need to be applied uh, to be able to get uh, you know, exquisite quality genomes. The entry to the top uh, represents things that we like, since they tell us, you know, the version of Arctic protocol that was used and what uh, what sequencing kits or uh, library prep methods was used, and that that we could um, we could automate proce procedures and protocols and parameter cutoffs for different types of uh, data if if we had available uh, metadata for that. Um, the the bottom right is less good. Um, Companies are not the only ones who provide less good metadata. Uh, it's pervasive uh, throughout the database. So, um, uh, but you really don't know outside of it that it's an Amplicon uh, data set that was sequenced that, um, that that's not, not good. Yeah, the top one does look like, uh, uh, like Torsten. That's, that's right, does a thorough job. Um, uh, so our best way so far has been just by matching library name. That's inconsistent. Uh, you do sometimes find uh, links in comments. Um, I think, uh, I'm not positive that this run has it in the metadata, but um, you know, if you want to try finding this automatically, it's really tough since it's in the experiment title. But there is no good field to capture deposit of genomes in a uh, a complementary uh, database. Um, ideally, you'd go to a bioproject ID and you'd have both linked. Uh, we've tried that. Uh, th those are extremely scarce. So um, uh, I, I think, I mean, our personal view is that this, um, this virus is going to be here for a while. Uh, I have a number of different reasons for really wanting to tackle this, as I'm sure all of you do. Uh, It'd be nice if we could um, have a unified process where we understood the quality of different data. We could adopt a common framework. If there are better ways to do it, great. If there, there undoubtedly be uh, disagreements, but we've managed to come together uh, on a number of other fronts. So I think this is a uh, fairly low bar to achieve uh, if, if we can really inform and improve some of these uh, databases. Um, and any work that results of it. Happy to take any questions. All the technical stuff, I'll probably defer to my folks, uh, some of which I'm sure are online. Otherwise, um, uh, feel free to ping us with any questions, feedback. If things don't work, let us know. That'd be great. Um, it's, a, it's a work in progress, but we felt good enough to, uh, to have a few, few people hammer on it. And uh, we welcome you guys too, as well, if you're if you're allowed to uh, upload data, or if you can grab the Docker, let us know how that works for you, if the documentation is appropriate enough. And, um, and one of the things we have not tried yet so far is the GISAID submission button, since we've had nothing to submit. And so that would be really nice. We do have uh, thoughts on creating the exact same thing 
uh, for a coupled SRA uh, data dump plus uh, genome. Uh, this would have to be in collaboration with uh, NCBI uh, to be able to accommodate both these things. Uh, right now, you'd need a bio project ID or you need to email individual in people and you know there'd be a back and forth. This is um, not conducive to putting things into uh, the primary repositories that we're used to, um, and which is why GISAID has been such a, uh, a success in being able to accommodate uh, the type of analytics that we really want. All right, thank you, Patrick. That was <clears throat> very encompassing tool. I love the data visualizations, and I think it also follows a lot of the guidance that we've been trying to develop and like you said, that, that spheres group in terms of reference guided, um, primer trimming, and then all the way through. And then I even looked like you can pick your read mapper um, of choice. Uh, uh, we, we've, uh, we've maintained some flexibility from our original system, but um, in, in the end, it would be ideal just to have a push button lockdown. Uh, yeah. I don't know, I don't know what, I don't know who is running data right now, but you know, it'd be nice if at the end of the run, your sequencing tech, I mean, I know some groups don't, they, the scientists do everything, but mm -hmm. if you have a tech that's running it and they have like no clue even what they're running, it'd be nice to have a push button protocol for, uh, for this that, you know, there's always a, the ability to back check. Um, uh, we've toyed with the ability just to modify the consensus genome so that you can then feel comfortable that you get the visual inspection, you've looked at all the raw underlying data, and then you can click submit. So all of these things, uh, it'd be nice to, to co-develop. Um, uh, we could take claim that this is a, you know, an awesome thing. I think um, the benefit is mostly on the GUI. Uh, the protocols themselves are pretty standard and you know, there are a number of workflows that could do uh, very similar with probably just as high quality. It's just, you know, being able to provide this as ready access to individuals, I think is, is key. Yeah, agreed. And I think uh, that's why Staff B is gonna be a pretty interesting group for, uh, for, for people to get registered. So, so on that, to get registered, is there anything that users might need to do uh, to start uploading data and maybe- uh, It's username password based. Um, so we've, uh, uh, we've undergone the hardship of having uh, Los Alamos computer security team try and hack it. So, um, uh, which it was hackable in the original instance uh, long ago. Uh, uh, we've survived a few hacks since. So, uh, I mean, uh, if you don't want data to be released anywhere or viewed by anyone else, uh, do, just don't go online because we are admins and we can look at data if we really want. Um, uh, but if you want help installing a local instance, that's not a problem. We, we're happy to help you out. Um, and also, if there are parameters that you feel are just so much sweeter for your, either your protocol or in general, um, you know, this would be a benefit to the rest of the community. And it's, uh, for us, it's just an easy, it's just an easy tweak. Um, we could make other things available on this site. We took, we stripped out the taxonomy profiling because um, the, the first labs we were talking to, their primary goal was get genomes into, into the databases. It was not exploratory for the lung metagenome, which I showed you early on. We would use our general edge bioinformatics tool for that because it does metagenomics really well. But, um, but this, the goal for this really was uh, to try and drive towards that push button submission of high quality genomes. I think that's where a lot of state labs are, uh, especially at first, is getting the assemblies so they can input their, their read data into those international repositories. But then second to that, too, um, is being able to conduct local investigations in real time where they might have levels of metadata that they otherwise So, um, yeah, w with that, we are uh, also working on just creating a quick JSON file that you can simply drop on, uh, you know, on the Bedford Lab suite of tools. Yes. If you... If you're really interested, I, we, you know, along with everyone else, we have a local um, uh, install of NextStrains. So, and I, I understand that's really uh, useful and common uh, uh, in link between anyone in public health labs who want to use this for epidemiology. So, yeah, we're. Um, uh, I don't suspect that that'll take very long. That's a pretty easy 
uh, go. It's just transforming the data uh, and providing it for, for drop-in. We'll be doing running a few tests ourselves and then we're happy to, in fact, we'd be happy to have a few test labs. So we're uh, a fully collaborative lab and everything that we normally do is open source. So our goal is not uh, any glory really. It's just to try and make things a little bit better. Yeah, that'd be fantastic. And, and even speaking here in Virginia, that's those those are the exact steps we went through. First, we were trying to make sure that we can get it assembled. Then we were making sure we can get it uploaded to the databases. Then we're now we have, have uh, gotten the, a local next train install. We're generating those JSON files. Um, but that has taken you know Virginia is a little unique in that currently we have three bioinformatics scientists all working on those three different pieces. Right. Yeah. Right. Um, whereas being able to distribute that, we've been able to do that with DC. Um, but like to getting that at scale, having a single platform like this, uh, that is one hosted at, uh, Los Alamos national labs, or people can also have locally so that there's no, you know, um, transfer of data, I think it'd be really powerful. Yeah. We're, yeah, we, we hear the, the groups that are concerned about data transfer. And so having a locally installable and something that's fairly simple, like Docker, uh, was one of our primary goals. And really, we only started tackling this probably closer to March, um, but it was really just stripping out other things from our primary um, edge repo and uh, and then implementing some of these stricter um, consensus calling measures. Uh, we're hoping to submit this, you know, just as a note somewhere uh, in the next few days. We've got most sure. of it written up. We we're just waiting on some of the validation piece, but we'll see. We got about five minutes left in the hour for any other questions. Hi, this is Kelsey Wisconsin, and I was just kind of glancing through the GitHub repository. I think it's a fascinating project and how you have it set up. Just kind of glancing through, it looks like it's kind of in the back end running a lot of like Perl scripts and using yeah. Yeah. JavaScript to uh, supply oh, the oh, UI. I've demanded <laughs> that Perl get ripped out, but you know, it's not resistance to it. It's just we're busy with too many other things. But. Sure. Yeah. And I was just curious, like in that line, like you mentioned the idea of using drag and drop, you know, JSON files and things like that. And I'm just wondering about in the future, could you see yourself switching to like a workflow language set up so that you could yeah. literally just drag so and drop we've, workflow? Yeah. Files? We're, as part of the NMDC, we're converting everything to WDL uh, Cromwell. And that will be implemented here as well. It's just we didn't have time to roll out something uh, this fast and, and yet essentially rewrite. So the, the GUI has to essentially be completely rewritten from scratch. And that's good, just going to take a number of months. And we can't, uh, we, we just didn't want to wait for that. But absolutely, you're, you're right. We've started modularizing a lot of stuff already. Um, uh, so we're partway there, but we have a ways to go for the, the GUI side. Yeah, I, mean, I I think it's an awesome project. I'm by no means. It's just no, yeah. no, no. I, <laughs> I I appreciate it. It reinforces uh, to to my folks listening uh, that, that this is actually uh, you know something that people will be paying attention to, and, and we are as well. Awesome. Thanks. Yeah, that that transfer to workflow languages is something a lot of the folks here in staff B have also started to adopt. Um, Sure. Had a similar conversation of, of Whittle versus uh, Nextflow. A lot of us have adopted Nextflow, um, so maybe that's a conversation worth having. Yeah, uh, uh, yeah. There could be ultimate uh, <laughs> long debates on on what where to go or what to do. Yeah. There's sure. really only one Cromwell advocate. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure uh, Daniel, if he's on, would be an advocate as well. <laughs> Yeah, Danny got to me first before uh, Kevin and Kelsey with Nextflow. So. <laughs> right. He's a bit biased, though, being at Bro. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we, we've had our own debates, but we just want to go with whatever, you know, the l larger groups are going with since sure. it's easier to accommodate updates and stuff. No, no diss on any other uh, you know, workflow. Sure. Methods. And I did want to ask, so I think most of the states uh, definitely involved in the call, and then I'm aware of sequencing. Most of us are definitely using Arctic. I think uh, V2 and V3 at this point, it looked like those are already built in. Um, yeah. Uh, more people are doing Arctic with MinION and uh, Illumina. 
but a, a couple of us are also actually DC is using the Ion S5. Um, is that are those primers already pre-built in there as well? Uh, oh, it, it is a primer. Yeah, I think it's an amplicon. Yeah, I'd have to ask Chen Chi if he's on the line. Okay. Um, uh, the nice thing about this group is they're uh, mostly independent. They do a bunch of stuff without me knowing, and so it's <laughs> quite possible. And right now, I only integrate the RT version one, two, three primer sets. But users are always allowed to uh, upload their own upload primers or adapters to Trim. Okay, that's great to know. Yeah, I think the Amplisteak is proprietary, so I don't know if they will share. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's also a concern to put some. <laughs> but yeah. Okay, that's good to know. Uh, as part of the, uh, with, with the Coronavirus Standards Working Group, uh, there's a, at least a um, silent uh, push to try and get companies not to make uh, proprietary primer sequences, probe sequences. I mean, this is just quasi useless at this stage. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if we really want to, we'll sequence it. Yeah, we can't distribute it. You break a term of an agreement or something just by buying their product. But I feel like that's sure. a little bit much at this stage, especially with so much at, at risk. I agree. And, and uh, we are at the top of the hour. I want to make sure that we respect your time, Patrick, and everyone else. Um, so thank you for this talk. Thank you for the tool. I think we have uh, all the resources and links uh, to start registering. If we have questions, um, your email. You reach out. We're, we're a relatively friendly bunch. At least <laughs> and I think most of you guys are also on the Slack channel. I think that's where you're going to see a lot of the technical questions. Yeah, I'm sorry. I just cannot keep up with all the Slack. Yeah, there's a lot of Slack channels. <laughs> all over the place. Too many red uh, balls all over. I it's driving me sure. insane. Uh, but yeah, so with that, thank you guys. Uh, we'll make this recording available on the website shortly. Uh, Patrick, if you don't mind too, if uh, we also like to try to get like PDFs of the slides up there too. So yeah, sure. All right, great. Well, thank you everybody. Thank you, especially Patrick and everybody uh, that's a part of your team. Uh, this yeah, it looks like it can be a really useful tool, especially for the staff community. So thank you guys. Yeah, good. Thanks. Be healthy.